pray. God, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for everybody that's here today, God. I pray that you'd be glorified, that you would uh, speak to me, that you would uh, sanctify us through your word, and make us look like you. So, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome, everybody. Glad everybody made it. Um, the, uh, like always, this first time is kind of more interactive time, and then we'll do our time of confession, and then we will get into our first by first sermon. So, let me ask this. What what book are we studying right now? The Bible. Bible. That's a great answer. Let's get a little more, a little Micah. more narrowed down. Micah. Micah? No, we're not studying Micah today. <laughs> oh, Second uh, Timothy. Uh, well, we Corinthians. we did read from Second Timothy. We'll read from Second Timothy again in a little bit. Uh, we're actually not going to do the book of Micah today. We still have the last part of chapter seven. Which Pastor Mike's going to come back and preach next week. Um, what? Well, hold it there. Put a pin in it because we're going to come back to Micah 7 next week. Okay. But after we finish the book of Micah, we're going to a new series. And so I'm actually starting that new series today. We're going to finish Micah and then go back to the new series. Super confusing, I know. But things happen, you know? Um, so the next thing, uh, we're going to move on to what we're going to preach next. The next thing we're going to look, like, to look at is our and statements. If I said our and statements, what would I be talking about? <coughs> Any guesses? And? Is it peanut butter and jelly? No, no. two things. Probably not. No, probably not peanut. Uh, milk and cookies. Mm -hmm. no. 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 Nobody know what our end statements are. Things that go. Gasoline and fire. Yeah. yeah. No, no. With our end statements, we want to push our church to be perfectly balanced. Like this little knife that Thanos has. Thanos has is perfectly balanced, right? Um, and we want to be perfectly balanced in six areas. Uh, and we've talked about these several times before, but we haven't talked about them in a while. So we're going to talk about them this summer before we start the book of Acts in the school year. Um, so the six statements we want to be perfectly balanced in is we want to be theologically sound and we want to be culturally relevant. You remember these yet? We want to know others and we also want to be known. We want to meet needs. And we also want to proclaim Jesus. We want to be missionaries. And we want to be ministers. We want to do missions. But we also want to plant churches. Missions and plant churches. And lastly we want to invest. And we want to invite. These are the and statements we talked about. A long time ago. Uh, but this week we're going to be talking about the first one. Theologically sound. And culturally relevant. So let me ask this. What do you think happens if a church neglects either theologically sound or culturally relevant? It loses relevancy. It loses relevancy if it's not culturally relevant. Like That's it, good. It, becomes, it disappears. Okay, okay. Good. No, it's not noticed. It's, it's not noticed. noticed, okay. What else? Fall into apostasy. Fall into apostasy, good. Yeah, that's true. Anybody else? Let's say you walk into a church. You, you walk into a church, and when you walk in, you see this. What is your first thoughts? Get out. Get out? Why? It's, it's not a church. Right there. It's not a church? Dude, what is it? What, what is it neglecting? The Bible. A lot of stuff. The Bible. So this, would you say this church is not theologically sound? Yes. Why? Because it supports dead. Okay. That's good. So first, I would say we have a female pastor. We know that's against yeah. what Scripture teaches, right? Second, like, like, uh, like uh, Ben said... Uh, we see the rainbow flag. We don't have a problem with rainbows, right? God created the rainbow. Rainbows are good. Um, we see the rainbow in the sky, and it reminds us that God's not going to flood the earth again. Um, but but yeah. it, it also, people hijacked it to mean inclusive, to mean accepting and affirming. And so whenever you see rainbows like this in a church, you see pastors that are supporting this, we know they're gay affirming, and we know that's wrong. It's sin. So it's not theologically sound anymore, right? As Pastor Jamie said, they've slipped into apostasy. Um, in this church, not only is it not theologically sound, but it's taken a whole other part of the culture apart, right? It looks like our culture. It's no longer set apart. It's not this holy thing anymore. But what happens when a church is not culturally relevant. It, or like a 
They haven't listened to it. Okay, okay. This is the church irrelevant. So pretty close, right? A church that doesn't know anything about the place that it's in can't do missions properly. It can't be on mission properly. The church must, must know the sins of our day. They must be able to communicate in a way that people of our day understand. And uh, they also need to hold on to solid theology. So this is what happens one of two. That there's two different ways that people tend to fall off this. On one side, you'll fall off by just separating yourself from society altogether, closing yourself off, not being a part of any community, um, or even like looking a little like the Amish. I mean, that's what they've done. They've completely separated themselves from society around them. Yeah, you don't even know what that is. It's so irrelevant. They don't. They don't use technology. They don't do anything. They say, which in some ways it actually, it actually, it benefits them. I mean, they're. They're not like on their phone all the time and they can make some cool stuff. <laughs> uh, but in other ways, they're so set apart from our society that they look like they're from a different different time zone. Like they just suddenly dropped them in from the 1800s or something. Um, they don't look anything like our culture. They don't know anything about our culture. Um, so they've separated themselves completely out of it. That's not good. But on the other side, like with the first picture, they take on our culture. They begin to look like our culture. Um, or they'll do things that, that are completely against Scripture, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So let me ask you this. What do you think it means to be theologically sound? Uh, what is theology? Uh, theolog theology is the study of God. Like, know what the Bible says and tell people... Okay. Why it says no pain and stuff. Or okay, that's sound good. sound like you uh, know what the Bible is. Okay, that's, that's good. Christianity. Okay. Know the laws and enforcing them. Okay. There's two parts to it. There's two parts to being theologically sound. The first one, um, the first part of this is knowledge. We're going to know what the Bible says. We're going to teach the full word of God. In our culture, some things in the Bible will not be popular. But we must teach what we see in Scripture. So knowing what the Bible says is pretty important. 2 Timothy 3, that Mr. Pastor Jamie read earlier, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. So knowing God's Word is how we, is how we know and how we hear from God. In this verse, we see, we see that we are to teach Scripture, that we're to know Scripture, we're to train from Scripture. However, this verse doesn't end there, right? It doesn't just end with what we know, right? What, what, what else does it say? Do you know we should be trained to use it? That's right. This verse doesn't just end there. It just says, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. So this is... This is like this verse is screaming action. So being theologically sound shouldn't just affect our brains. It should affect our hearts and lead us to action. Following God is not just a call to know God or to know about God. It's a call to die to yourself, to take up your cross, and follow Him. Being theologically sound is not something we just believe with our head. It's a belief that drives us to action. One pastor that we listen to a lot, uh, Doug Wilson, he says, you don't actually believe a theology until it's coming out of your fingertips. You don't actually believe a theology until it's coming out of your fingertips. What do you think that means? <clears throat> you don't believe it until you've done it. Always. Until you've done it, that's right. A belief is something that should affect how we view and interact with the world around us. It should not just leave us sitting around doing nothing. A church with no engagement in the world around us is a disobedient church. It is a church that has bad theology. As a church, as Crossword Church, um, we will teach some theology and we'll be, we'll be on guard against false teaching. Um, we'll sing songs that teach sound theology. We'll correct, uh, we'll correct one another with love um, when false teaching comes up. We're going to stir up one another to loving good deeds. We'll be equipped for every good work. Um, we will share the gospel in love. 
Uh, we will call people to repent and follow Jesus. We will be generous in our giving because Jesus gave so generously to us. This is how we're going to, this, this is how this theology is going to come out in our fingertips. It's going to come out in the way that we live our life. So let me ask you this. What do you think it means to be culturally relevant? You need to know what's going on in the world. Okay, you need to know what's going on in the world. That's good. What else? You need to know how to interact with the world. <coughs> yeah, you need to know how to interact with the world. Good. What do you say? So you're not like the Irish or whatever you said when they... The Irish? <laughs> I'm Amish. I'm Amish. The Amish. Amish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Irish? Yeah. Irish. Those lip Irish. Irish. Yeah, no, Amish. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. leprechauns, you care about gold. Yeah. Uh, so a very popular church has this quote. Listen to this quote. Tell me what you think about it. We will do anything short of sin to reach people far from God. What do you think about that quote? Is it good? Is it bad? Wait, what? We will do anything short of sin to reach people far from God. I think it's good. You think it's good? I might be misunderstanding. Like, not sin? Or we'll do anything but sin to reach people far from oh, God. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. 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 it's good? Anything but I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate the sentiment, especially in their desire to reach people far from God. That's good. The problem comes in, and often, it often happens, um, is... Uh, this ends up actually completely being neglected. At some point in time, no longer does the church service mean anything about worshiping God, but it actually becomes, it actually begins to look more like a service. It actually begins to be this thing to entertain people, uh, to make people feel good, rather than being a worship time to Almighty God. Um, on top of that, not, or not, not, not just that, but also, as, as we've seen it play out, um, churches that tend to take on this mindset um, eventually fall into sin. Eventually, they lead to like that first picture. Eventually, now we want to be we want to be welcoming, inclusive for everybody that comes in here, and we're not going to talk about sin, and we're not going to call out sin to our culture, and uh, they just neglect that cultural side of it, and they adopt the culture as their identity. We saw this just in Easter. There was a church that had, uh, they were seeing that, that instead of having normal worship time at their Easter service, they were just having like, it looked like the Grammys or the Emmys or whatever the award is where you could sing. Um, they're singing all these popular songs. Songs that people probably like, but it's not worshiping God. Um, and they were up dancing and twerking on stage. It was horrible. Um, so there's two sides that people fall off on, right? You don't want to fall off on either side of that. Um, here's what I want you to remember when we're talking about culturally relevant. When I say culturally relevant, I mean we are going to teach, preach, and share the gospel in a way that makes sense to the culture. And this means also engaging with the sins of our culture. This doesn't mean that everybody's going to like what we have to say. In fact, it's almost usually always the opposite. They almost never like hearing the gospel and hearing their sins. And they definitely don't like being called to repent. People don't like that. Nevertheless, we're going, to do our, we're going to do our best to communicate the gospel in a way that our culture understands. And we're going to call the people where we are to, where, where we're at to repentance. That's what we're going to do. That's, that's what being theologically sound and culturally relevant looks like. We're not going to neglect either of them. Um, but this is, a, uh, this is something we do not always do a great job at. And for that, we have much to confess. So let's stand and we'll go into our time of confession. Um, I'll read the words in white and I'll read the ones in yellow. Lord God, we confess to you and to one, to one another. We have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had the mind of Christ. We have grieved you by wasting your gifts and by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, and free us from our sin. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise be to God. Just stay standing with us.
Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Open up your Bible to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 is where we're going to be today. Um, starting in verse 16. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry today if my sermon might be a little uh, choppy or short. I don't think it's going to be short though. Um, I found out yesterday at 2 o'clock that I was going to do this. So uh, it's going to be a good time. But it is a sermon I've preached before. So maybe it will also be familiar. So sorry if it's too familiar to you. Um, let me go ahead and set the stage for Acts 17 um, before we dive into the text. So uh, in Acts 17, Paul, he was in Athens. He's waiting on Timothy and Silas to show up or to come with him. And while he's waiting on them, he was just people watching. He's watching the Athenians. He's watching to see what they do. He's watching to see how they interact with one another. He's watching to, to see how people engage with one another. We did this a little in Puerto Rico. I remember, I think it was the trip we went on, just the trip we went on, where we found out that the Puerto Rican people, they have long greetings and long goodbyes. Um, but they, he, he's watching these people, and he's, he's trying to figure out what is it about this culture. And as he's watching these people, he notices something. A little background about the Athenians. Um, it was said that in the city of Athens, you could actually find an idol in Athens before you could ever find a person. This was a very, very pagan city. Um, and the people loved worshiping their idols. Well, maybe not loved, but they were scared. They feared their idols. Um, they feared demons is what they feared. Um, and they, 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 they did this so much, so they, were, they were so afraid, in fact, they had this one idol that was a faceless idol um, specifically for a God that they did not know. Just in case somebody had come in and started saying, yeah, you should worship this God, they're like, yeah, we actually have that God who's over here. Um, and they'd add it to the stack, and then they have this new faceless idol. Um, and it was, they called it the unknown God. Um, and uh, they just wanted to keep all of their bases covered. It was in this, um, this God that they did not know that Paul brings with him to the city of Athens. God they had never heard of, God they didn't know, Paul's bringing it to them in the city of Athens. And this is where we'll pick up in verse 16. So look at verse 16. It says this, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Um, so we see Paul's spirit was provoked by what he saw. The city was full of idols, right? It was full of these man-made statues getting the praise that only God deserved. And, and this didn't make Paul happy. He was stirred by his emotions. Uh, the last time we talked about this, I, I talked about whenever, whenever I would go to other countries, or, or I, I went to a Hindu temple one time, and they're beating these drums, and they're ringing these bells, and they're trying to get the attention of all these false gods. And you just get angry. Um, obviously, I've never had kids, but I had a dog, and they're like almost the same, right? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, but I remember when I first got Coco, uh, I would always get mad at her for digging in the trash. I, I would always get mad at her. She would go, she would always do it when I wasn't home, and she loved digging in the trash. Usually it was to get something like a bone or, or something that was in there. But I love Coco, and if I give her something, it's, it's because I knew it, it won't hurt her. It would be good for her. Um, and so if I throw something in the trash and I didn't give it to her, then she should know. I didn't give it to her for a reason. She didn't care. She wanted the garbage. She wanted that thing. Um, despite what she knew, I actually knew what was better. I knew what was good for her. I knew it was good for her to have. Um, and if I thought it was bad for her, then I wouldn't give it to her. Um, I didn't hate my dog for digging in the trash. Although it was super frustrating. I'd walk in and there'd be trash everywhere. But I didn't hate her for digging in the trash. I just knew better than her about the content that she was after. Likewise, Paul's not angry because he's hating these people. He's angry because he knows what they're worshiping is garbage. He knows that what they're worshiping is false. He knows what's best for these people. And more than that, he was angry because God was being robbed of the praise and glory that he deserved. And because of that, he needed to do something. And that's where we pick up in verse 17. 
Verse 17 says, So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. So while Paul was angry about God being robbed, he was also heartbroken for these people. And this led him to reason with the people, to plead with the people, because Paul was now following Jesus, he had a new worldview. In his new worldview, this is, this is uh, what a worldview is. This, uh, this little map shows us, it shows us where did we come from, what's our origins, what are we here for, where are we going, what's wrong, what's the solution, and how do we know all this is true? This is what a worldview is. It's a set of beliefs on the most fundamental issues in life, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. As Paul is now following Jesus, he has a new worldview. He, he understood that we are people created to glorify God. However, we are also sinful. And because of that, we are destined for hell. But God was rich in mercy, and he graciously sent Jesus to bring us back into a relationship with him. He knew that one day he would, we would all stand before God and be judged. And because of that, he also knew this. Uh, he was led to action. So because, because Paul knew this, he was led to action. His theology led him to action. It came out of his fingertips. It, it provoked him to do something. He was so convinced of this that he thought if he doesn't share the gospel with these people, how will they know God? How will they know that God is going to judge them? How will they know their purpose? How will they know that God has made a way for them to be saved of that judgment that's coming? Paul knew all of this. And so he, he, he taught them. And, and as he's teaching them, he, they, they begin to take him to a different place. And this is where we pick up in 19. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this, news, what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So we don't have a whole lot of information here. We don't know how the conversation all went down. Um, but I can imagine that uh, as they're talking, there are some skeptics there. Um, and these philosophers that are there, and they have a skewed worldview. They have a worldview that's contradictory to Paul's. And on top of that, because they're philosophers and skeptics, they think they know best. They think they're the smartest men in the room. Um, they're probably coming up with some of the hardest questions to try to stump Paul. They're trying to come up with some, some difficult, ridiculous scenarios to challenge his worldview. And Paul just keeps bringing them back to the gospel. And eventually, these people kind of get done with it, and they're like, fine, we're going to take you to the higher-up philosophers. We're going to take you to the real people that can, that can challenge you. These would be the uh, college professor philosophers of the day, um, the Socrates and the Plato and all that. Um, so they take Paul to the Areopagus, where there are uh, people that basically just stay up there all day to debate. They stay up there all day to argue and to learn and, and to hear new things. Um, and they think they're essentially throwing into these philosophical rules. These, these people that spend all day learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Just a side note here. Um, it's no wonder that these people have so many gods. As they're, as they're up there standing and they're thinking, they spend all of their time at the Areopagus. Hearing and, telling, hearing and telling new things, of new theories, of new things that are just coming up in their head. And it's basically this breeding ground for idols. It's this place where people can just come in and just spit off the next new thing, and then they adopt it. They challenge it. If it stands up to the challenges, then they adopt it. But this was no match for Paul. Paul wasn't worried about this. Um, for all these people, he's going to continue to do the same thing he does the entire time. He's going to come back to the gospel. And he's going to do it in such a way that the people of Are the Areopagus should know what he's saying. He's going to do it in such a way 
that, that, that as Paul is preaching the gospel here, um, when they stand before God, they will have no excuse. They won't be able to say, we didn't hear. They will have heard the gospel, and they will either respond, or they will harden their hearts. So let's read this next section and see, see what happens. Verse 22. It says, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects you worship, I also found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. <clears throat> so Paul first recognizes that these are very religious people. And they were. They were very religious people. They were very scared people. Because they didn't want to miss a God, right? Probably even in this time, this very self-righteous people. They love their philosophers and stoics. Paul is very familiar with this. This isn't anything new for Paul. Paul, being a Jewish man, he was, he was aware of the same things. Jews were religious people. They were God-fearing people. They were also self-righteous people. Paul dealt with people like this his entire ministry. So this was nothing new to him. And Paul, uh, he dealt with these people in a quick, loving, and very meticulous way. He proclaimed the gospel to them. And he proclaimed the gospel to them in a specific way. Let's read verse 24. Verse 24 says, <clears throat> The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think of that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art thought, thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he, was, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So Paul, he begins by challenging their worldview, right? Remember, we looked at this where worldview was. He begins by challenging their worldview. He informs them that God made all things. He gives life to all things. He upholds all things. He's moving all things forward. He tells them that, that God's not stuck in a temple. He's not stuck in some random temple. He's, he, he doesn't need man in any way that these idols needed him. He's not going to be served by human hands the way these idols are. This, this, the, the one true God, he tells them, actually gives mankind purpose. He tells them that God is going to judge. That mankind everywhere should repent. He tells them that we can know all of these things are true because Jesus rose from the dead. Paul quickly and methodically taught them the entire Christian worldview in just a few verses. He challenged everything they thought they knew. And he called these people to repentance. He challenged everything they thought they knew. Um, last summer at camp, I told a story of uh, a guy named Boniface. Boniface was a, uh, a Christian missionary in like the first 500 years of the church, so pretty early on. And he goes to what is now modern day Germany. And when Boniface goes into Germany, he notices that there are pagans there, Viking pagans. So think like Thor, Odin, Loki, things like that. These are the things they worship. Much like any pagan religion, um, they, were, they were led on by war, by murder, chaos. This is what these, these false gods led them to do. And these people in the Ger German tribes, they, uh, they thought that gods were in the trees. 
specifically, they had one tree called um, Thor's Oak. They believed was Thor's tree. They believed that if anybody were to touch that tree, they would die. They also believed that they had to sacrifice to Odin. Or they had to sacrifice to Thor or Odin would get mad and destroy them. And so every year, at the same time, they would go and they would actually make a human sacrifice at the tree. Um, one year, whenever uh, Boniface is in town, um, he's in there trying to preach the gospel, and it's actually the king, the, the, the chief's son that they're supposed to sacrifice. And Boniface comes up to stop it. And he didn't tell them about the gospel. He tells them how, how Thor and Odin and all these false gods that they worship are false, how they're not real, how they're not actually mad at them because they can't be. But that there is a God that sent his own son so that you don't have to die, so that your son doesn't have to die. He shared the gospel with him. And he said, to prove it, I'm going to chop down this tree. And these people, they had one of two reactions. One, either they were like, this man's not going to chop down this tree. He will surely die. Thor will kill him before he's able to chop down this tree. The other side, there were those that thought Thor's going to kill all of us if we let him chop down this tree. Despite these people's efforts, Boniface chopped down the tree. Nothing happens. These people then want to know more about God. They want to know more about, about, about how Jesus came to take the punishment for their sins. And they, they actually end up using that tree to build a cathedral in that town. Boniface, like Paul, was not afraid to stand up to, to the false gods at the time. Boniface, like Paul, wasn't worried about what, what all these people would think. He knew that God deserved glory. Boniface knew that, that these people were worshiping garbage. And he was going to call these people to repent. So what does this mean for us? As we read this passage, as we hear the story of Boniface, Paul, when he went into Athens, was learning what Athenians saw as valuable. He was learning their fears. He took note of the common sins, specifically to them was idolatry. He was learning to speak to them in a way that made sense. And all the while, he was coming back to the gospel and all of that. Many of us have lived in West Texas our entire lives. We know the values. We know what a typical person fears. We should know by now the popular sins of our culture. They're, they're mostly celebrated in society today. We should be prepared to speak the gospel into that. We should be bold enough to speak the gospel into that. We should be bold enough to speak the gospel and then call people to repentance. As we've been here, as we've looked at the town, Mike, Jamie, and I, we would all say that the typical person thinks that they're good with God. The typical person thinks they've never sinned against God or what sins they have done have been in secret so God probably didn't see it anyways. They think they're generally a moral person and that there's this some understanding before God, before them and God. They think that all these good things that they do will actually outweigh the bad things that they've done. But that's not what good judges do. Good judges look at crimes and sins and they say, you've committed this and this is the punishment for it, no matter what you've done on this side. The thought that we could ever do anything to win God's favor is a huge misconception in our culture. People in our context need to know that no matter what good we have done, we've sinned against a holy, eternal God, and with that sin has brought punishment on ourselves. However, God was merciful and gracious. He sent Jesus to live in a, be a perfectly obedient life in our place, and he took the punishment for sin that you and I deserve, and he rose again, and he's coming again, and will judge all people. It's important that people know that, that we're all going to stand before God one day. And in those days, there will be some people that try to say that they've done some good things in Jesus' name. There will be some people that try to say, yeah, but I'm not that bad. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. If you actually believe these things, I want to ask you, what are you going to do with this information? How should this then affect our lives? We believe a theology. We, we talked about earlier, we don't actually believe a theology until it's coming out of our fingertips. So how should this affect our lives? 
How should this drive us to action? If we believe that there's going to be people that are going to stand before God one day, and He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And that will happen. How should that affect how we live our day-to-day -day lives with the people that are around us? This should build this desire in us, like Paul, like Boniface, to be able and be willing to stand up challenge the sins of our day, call people to repentance, and call people into an authentic relationship with Jesus. This is what it, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus, to, to, to be theologically sound and culturally relevant. It means being willing to stand up, to read scripture, to, to apply scripture to our lives, and then it affects the world around us. Ephesians 2 ends... Uh, 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 2.10 ends by telling us that we are God's workmanship created for Christ to do good works that God prepared for, for us beforehand. We were created for a purpose. We were created with a reason. That worldview we talked about earlier. We have a reason. We know where we came from. We know what we're here for. We know where we're going. We know, we know what's wrong. We have the solution. We need to apply it. We need to take these things from here those outside of the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I uh, pray for us today um, that you would, uh, like I said, sanctify us, make us look like you, help us to be obedient to your word and to make much of you in this town. I pray that you would uh, use us, uh, even as we're preparing for Africa and getting ready for that trip, God, that you would, that you would use us in Africa. I pray that you would help us to be obedient to the word, to make much of you. And that you would grow your church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.